Hey, Joe, glad to have you on the show today. I'm glad to be here. Cool. Yeah, I'm excited. Uh, excited for our conversation today. It'll be a, an interesting one, and we'll kind of dive into the world of, of lean. But I guess just to give a little bit of context, you know, how did you get into the, the construction space initially? I think you and I were talking, was it your uncle that was maybe a master carpenter? And that's kind of the, the background there. Yeah, I mean, my, my, you know, like so many of your listeners, uh, it wasn't just my uncle. And, and I mean, I don't want to, I don't want to mislead anybody. It wasn't my, it's not like my dad, it, it was, it's my uncle, but it was my dad's sister's husband, if that makes sense. And he was, a, he was a master carpenter for a uh, company town uh, where I grew up and growing up, we were, you know, my dad was a, uh, actually a mechanical engineer among other things, but we always had remodeling projects or some kind of construction going, whether it was our own uh, commercial buildings or uh, rental units or stuff for other people. I mean, I literally grew up in sawdust. So as I'm sure most of your, uh, you know, your other listeners have as well, they can relate to that. So totally. um, yeah, that's about it. I mean, yeah, I think a lot of us have, you know, just some sort of family or, you know, friend connection in the industry, and then you kind of get into it, and it leads, you know, one thing leads to the next, and that was, I mean, one of my next questions was really, then you kind of jumped into the technology space, and maybe you can talk a little bit about that, because that's going to kind of come together as we, you know, go down this path a little bit. Yeah, I mean, that's actually how I got into consulting, too, because, I, I mean, I was I was a young builder. Uh, and this is in the dawn of the PC era, you know, 1980-ish, right? And my now wife, then girlfriend, stepdad, actually quit a very good job as a programmer to start his own PC business. And he had developed some point-of-sale software, and he was selling IBM clones. And this is back in the, you know, like the, 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 uh, 8086 days of, of IBM. I mean, very early DOS, IBM computers. Long story short, uh, you know, I was sick of typing my contracts and I was interested in, in you know, getting into, you know, it looked like something I could use. And so I traded him a very large torch down flat roof job for my first PC. <laughs> and that, and that we went from there. That's cool. Yeah. And so maybe fast forward us, you know, to today, I guess, you know, what is it that you're doing now and, and what's your role kind of in the, the space? Well, you know, I built, I built homes for about 15 years. I, you know, we, I started out as a remodeler and of course, you know, your shingles out as a remodeler and then you get your first new build and, and so forth. And, and during this time, builder technology was, you know, starting to blossom. And since, since I, you know, was, was a few years ahead of the uh, curve on that, I guess I, w I became the expert whether I wanted to or not. But uh, I got into consulting uh, in, in the mid-90s through, actually, through technology. My first clientele, it was all tech-based. And um, I learned very quickly that it wasn't enough to just, put the tools in place. Uh, it wasn't just software. It wasn't just, you know, whether you were running a Mac or a PC or any of that. In order to actually use those tools and get any kind of value out of them, you had to fix the nuts and bolts of the operation first. And so that's, that's how I got into consulting and that's how I got into operational consulting, uh, was trying to figure out a way to actually implement the technology successfully and one thing led to another you know like everything else uh and so at this point i mean we're we're flat out management consultants uh if i had to put it in a in a single sentence i mean the short version uh is that we help builders and remodelers model their operations around what we know to be best practices and we know their best practices because we have the data uh, you know, decades now of data that, that support that. And we look across 10 to 15 functional areas of a business. It's kind of a scorecard, I guess you could say, right? 
uh, we compare what a builder is doing, what they're actually doing, and we do that by on-site analysis. We analyze their documents, uh, all that sort of thing in each of these areas. And then we make a comparison to what we know to be best practice. And if they're deficient in one or more areas, we'll prioritize that and then help them put together an action plan to actually improve those areas and, and, and get better and, and reach the results they're looking to reach. And it's all numbers based. It's all metrics. You know, there, there's not a whole lot of sub subjectivity here. We know, for instance, what a builder should be budgeting for uh, marketing, what they should be budgeting for technology, what their what variances should be in their direct costs, et cetera, et cetera. And so we can do uh, an awful lot of budget versus actual comparison and chart that path, you know, from where they wherever they are now to where they want to get to. Ultimately, it's about uh, making more money, uh, you know, having a good solid business and a good balance of business and work life. So working, you know, it's, it's a buzz phrase, but working uh, smarter, not harder, et cetera, et cetera. But in order to do that, you really have to fix the fundamental problems in the business first. So that's what we do. We help them with that. And we have, uh, you know, we do training, we have coaching groups, all that sort of thing now. So uh, that's what we do when we work both with, with new home builders and, and remodelers and both uh, custom and production builders, although most of our business is on the production side. But we do have uh, some very good custom builder clients as well. Yeah, that's awesome. And and let's kind of dive into, you know, the topic of lean operations and quality. You know, a lot of um, people are looking at that and talking about that. But I guess, why is this such an important topic? And, you know, I guess, what does it actually mean? You know, cause you, I think you hear it a lot. You go, oh yeah. I think I know what that right. is. Right. Yeah. There's a lot of buzzwords around all this stuff. And I mean, you know, I think typical, uh, there's a lot of management consultancies to the general business, uh, 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 environment that try to turn this into rocket science. And it, it really is, it's much simpler than that. I mean, in, in a couple of sentences, lean is the ruthless, uh, elimination of waste in your business across all processes uh, and the addition of value. So those two things uh, working together create a lean, a lean environment. Uh, and again, it, it, you know, it's, it's, it's another issue of best practice. Uh, if something, you know, if you can do something in 10 steps and have exactly the same result as what you were doing in 20 steps, uh, and, and get the same outcome, that's less effort required, right? And that means you can do more uh, with the same staff, with the same equipment, uh, et cetera. Or uh, maybe, uh, that, maybe if you want to grow, that will set the stage for growth. But lean, lean is all about adding value and, and uh, eliminating waste. And a lot of builders mix up the idea of value to their market and quality. They think that because they're great craftspeople uh, and they can produce a flawless job, that they're that they're bringing value to the marketplace. And that may or may not be the case. Um, you know what what's valuable to one group of buyers might be something completely different than for another group. And value is defined as what your market is willing to pay for. Right? It's just that simple. It's not what the market will bear. The market will bear anything that you give it for free. You know, if you want to give away hardwood trim in a market that doesn't value hardwood trim, that's fine. You'll find somebody that's, that's very willing to take it. The question is, does that add any value to their project, either to their appraise, their appraise, their actual physical appraised value of the project or to them personally or, or whatever? So you can boil lean down. You know, you, you can say that, Anything that you do, uh, any process you undertake, and I want to talk about process for a minute too as we get into this, because that's a, that's another sort of buzz area that's very confusing to people. But uh, the, the the bottom the bottom line is, uh, if you're not adding value either to your buyer, primarily to your buyer, but also to your, uh, it could be to your company or to your product, 
then you shouldn't be doing it. And just to give you an idea how much waste is actually out there, we did a we did a lean analysis. This is a few years ago, but uh, one of our better clients today, uh, we identified something like 375 non construction processes. So this is just the back office we're talking about. We weren't even looking at the job site at this point in time. Uh, but I think this is pretty typical for the typical builder. Out of those 300 plus uh, processes, we identified half of them that were not value adding at all. <laughs> okay. And out of those, and out of the remaining, uh, we were able to trim those in process steps by about a third. So, you know, it's not unusual to find companies that are literally working twice as hard as they need to to get exactly the same result. But it, it's all about what your market is, is willing to pay for or what's going to, you know, promote your business down the line. And a good example of that, I'll give you an example of a situation where it might be prudent to do something that a customer is not willing to pay for. We had a client in the Seattle market that was spending significantly more uh, on staining the exteriors of their homes than than their uh, than their competition in this neighborhood, and we questioned it. I mean, it was it was significantly more. They were building fourplexes, uh, and you know, he said, "Well, why are you spending this money?" And he said, "Well, Joe, come here. You know, walk around the block with me," and we did. And the competing product after four or five years in that climate was really starting to look kind of shabby, you know, faded siding, chalking, all that sort of thing. Whereas this builder's uh, four-year-old homes, five-year-old homes still look brand new. And so that was hanging a shingle and a marketing shingle out for them. You know, they're spending a little bit more than the competition, but it was still adding value somewhere. Uh, not necessarily that a buyer would be willing to pay for, but, is still uh, is still added value, but you have to be careful because there's a lot of things that do not add value anywhere, and builders and, and remodelers are notorious for kind of cherrying up their their projects or doing a lot of things that uh, their customers are really not willing to pay for. Yeah, and I really like how you talk about it in terms of just the value piece because I feel like it's really a, I don't know easy to understand that and. I mean, I think in most businesses, you know, you can think about all the things that maybe you get excited about. You go, oh, yeah, this is super cool, or we do X, Y, Z. And then you realize at the end of the day, the customer either doesn't even know about it or doesn't care about it or, or the value wasn't communicated to them and so that they, can't, they aren't willing to pay for it. And so, yeah, I like how you talk about it in those terms. And you mentioned you kind of want to talk about process and kind of process improvement, I guess, why is that such an important part of this overall, you know, effort that we're making? Well, well, process improvement is, it's, you know, the flip side of the, of the quality coin, right? I mean, uh, when we talk about total quality and building what you sell, in other words, giving the customer exactly what they believe they're getting for the dollars paid, uh, that's value in, in their eyes, right? And that's quality in terms of what you what you put out there. But total quality is not just about the product. It's also about how you get there. And so to, total quality, well, for instance, if you, if you produce, say you're hired to do a custom kitchen, you produce a beautiful uh, custom kitchen, uh, immaculate in all respects, but it's two months late. Okay, so for two months, your client has to, uh, you know, maybe maybe rent out, you know, rent a place to live, or maybe have to put up with the dust and the dirt, or maybe they had to cancel a, a family gathering or whatever. Uh, you you still haven't delivered the full value at that point, and and so the the, the quality of the job itself is marred by by uh, inadequate process. I, I want to talk about process just to kind of define it. And very simply, uh, a, a process is just is nothing more than a series of steps, generally in order, right? Uh, a, B, C, D, that convert inputs into outputs. And that's all it is. 
So, for instance, the you know the macro process in home building or remodeling, uh, the inputs are all the labor, materials, subcontractors, machines. The output is the final product. But of that, you know, there are dozens and dozens of sub-processes. Uh, some are complex, some are simple. Some processes are built on top of other processes, et cetera. But uh, it's really nothing nothing any more complicated than a series of orderly steps that turn some kind of inputs into some kind of outputs. And so what we want to do is complete that output with as few steps as possible and, and as quickly as possible. And that's process improvement. If you if you can take something uh, and complete it defect free. Now the, the the you know the trick is the process has to conclude without defects. So whatever the output is supposed to be is what it needs to be. Uh, but if you can if you can cut steps, uh, waste steps essentially out of that process, that means you can do more work uh, with fewer people or less equipment or whatever, or you can do more work with the same people, equipment, et cetera. So whether you're looking just to, uh, you know, maybe have more family time or maybe you're looking to grow your business, a lot of younger uh, contractors and builders are on that growth curve. Uh, this is how you do it, uh, you know, without taking on uh, more and more overhead. And again, we have metrics for what you should be spending on overhead in each of these areas that we, so we can draw boxes around all that and know whether uh, whether a company is spending uh, too much or enough or whatever. There's some categories and, you know, some categories of overhead that are critical that you fully fund, okay? One of them is supervision. You know, you don't, you, you can't get away with, with, uh, underfunding your supervision. You have to have enough boots on the ground, whether you're an owner builder and you're out there in the trenches yourself or whether you're hiring superintendents or lead carpenters or whatever, we know how much uh, as a percentage of revenue you have to spend to be successful. The other category that you have to fully fund is your marketing. And anybody that's, uh, uh, you know, uh, the marketing gurus will tell you that just because things are rolling along great, uh, word of mouth referral, uh, now that can turn on a dime. And if you haven't been putting a marketing effort out there, and that doesn't necessarily mean buying a lot of advertising. It doesn't even necessarily mean electronic advertising or digital. I mean, it could just be making sure you've got a good referral network set up and you're actually mining it on a regular basis. Uh, you need to be prepared for when that downturn comes. Other than those two categories, almost every other overhead category uh, is on the table to look at uh, as a as a as a place to reduce costs and and reduce those inputs. So, you know, that's what we try to to help our our clients do. If that yeah. makes sense. Yeah, we, yeah. we can tell immediately if there's a if there's a quality problem uh, with a builder. You know, many times we'll get a call. You know, well, we're, our, we're, we're completing late. We've got scheduling problems or, you know, we, there's some other, there's something else that's going on. We get out there and we find immediately the red flags are actually that there's just not enough supervision in place or, uh, you know, there may be enough bodies, but they're not well-trained enough or whatever. So the issues are not always what, what they appear to be on the surface, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. And I guess I'm kind of curious to you kind of describe this process improvement and like looking at all the steps for each of your processes and seeing if you can eliminate, you know, waste there. Is it, is it really that simple? Is it just, hey, here's this process, let's list out all the steps and can we remove any or, or is there, you know, how do you go about that if somebody's listening to this and they're going, okay, that sounds great. You know, I want to eliminate half the steps, but what does that look like when you yep. actually start doing it? Well, we, we, actually, we actually have to, you know, observe what's going on, right? And we, again, we do that through uh, direct observation, documentation, interviews, et cetera. And we actually map the processes. And in fact, uh, SMA, one of the videos we have up on SMA, I did a webinar on this 
uh, a few months back, how I go about mapping processes at a client. It's something that a couple of the builders wanted to, you know, try their hand at in-house. And so, uh, you know, have your viewers get a hold of me and I'll, I'll hook them up to that. But yeah, we go out and we physically map the process. What are the, you know, what steps are being undertaken right now? What, uh, what, in, what are the inputs? What's the, the, uh, the desired output? And then we, we determine, you know, where in that series of, of steps, uh, where's the value chain, if any. And, it, you know, many times we, we can eliminate, you know, in, entire, entire processes or pieces of processes, or we can suggest new ways uh, to go about doing the same thing. A lot of times it boils down to communication, right? Like you just get too many communication loops going and nobody's on the same page. And that's, as you know, the kiss of death in, uh, in this business because ultimately the customer suffers. If uh, everybody at the company, including, and I'm including subs, vendors, if we're not all, you know, speaking with one voice is kind of the buzzword we give it. But if we're not all speaking with one voice, every time the customer talks to somebody inside the company, they might get a different story or they might be misled uh, into thinking that the builder is going to do something that, you know, they never intended to do or, or whatever. And, you know, it all, it all ties back to keeping, uh, keeping those processes as concise as possible and the communication between parties as concise and consistent as possible. And uh, we can eliminate a lot of that. But, it, you know, there's a lot of effort involved. It's not, not an overnight thing. Uh, and it's, it requires continuous improvement. So, you know, it's one of those things you take um, the first stab at it. Uh, you see whether or not you're headed toward your goal. And if you are, great. And if not, you, you, you make further tweaks you know, in the next cycle and the next until you get to where you, you want to be. But it, there is considerable work involved. You have to be dedicated to it. Yeah, yeah, it definitely sounds that way. And uh, I want to shift gears just a little bit. Last time you and I talked, uh, you had been telling me a little bit about the zero punch list. And I think, um, right. you know, maybe you can talk about that a little bit and just describe what that, that concept is and what that looks like. Okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, this is the ultimate, you know, if, if, a, if a builder remodeler is firing on all eight cylinders as a well-oiled machine, uh, what we would expect is a defect-free project delivery. And, you know, typically, I mean, let's, let's talk about for a minute about the way it's done in the industry typically. Typically, uh, you know, the, the builder remodeler works through the project there's a lead carpenter on site or a superintendent. Uh, and as we go, mistakes are made, uh, days are lost, there's delays, things are delivered incorrectly, et cetera, et cetera. And we get to the end of the job and now we have some kind of a, uh, a punch list, you know, which is basically a list of all the stuff that we either didn't do at all <laughs> or, or we did incorrectly. Uh, and have to redo and rework by the way is, is you know that's one that's another of the deadly sins of a manufacturing process uh, so that's to be avoided at all costs defects are one of the primary wastes in a lean system we try to get 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 rid of but you know it's it's actually even worse than that because most builders and remodelers they get to the end of the job and there's this list of stuff that they did wrong or didn't do, didn't complete, whatever. And they're expecting their customer to, uh, to, to figure this out and tell them, you know, so we do a walkthrough uh, with our buyer and with the idea that we're on this fishing expedition for defects and omissions. And the customer comes up with this, you know, list that's a mile long, this, that, and the other thing. Uh, the builder remodeler scrambles around and tries to, uh, you know, get all this done, usually with 20 trades on top of each other in the house <laughs> at the same time, right? Uh, and, of course, they don't, they're never all completed. And so we just kind of stumble into the warranty sequence, right? And with the project never really having been formally completed. 
and with a bow tied around it. So, uh, you know, it would be like going to a car dealer. You're going to take delivery of your new uh, $80,000 uh, King Ranch F-250, right? But you show up and there's a door missing on it. And, well, don't worry, Mr. Powell. Uh, we'll We'll put that door on in six weeks when we come back for our warranty check. Right. Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. Right. And yet this is what, you know, or it would be like, uh, you know, expecting a customer to go into a car dealer with a set of calipers to make sure the cylinder walls were bored out correctly in the engine. I mean, it's, it's absurd when you think about it, but that's how this industry operates. And I mean, still to this day. So what we found is we have to, we have to catch, we have to catch defects, omissions, rework very early and we have a process in place whereby we can do that and it and it starts you asked me about total quality and and zero punchless delivery it actually starts way back when you define uh what it is you're going to sell to the public you know what's your product going to be uh and your what we call your unique selling proposition i mean this is a sales buzzword but honestly I, I have to start here to explain it because otherwise uh the rest won't fall into place for sure if you can't tell me within you know a sentence or two what it is you know that that would make somebody purchase a remodeling job or a new home from your company versus your competition in other words if you have not defined your niche if you you know if, if you can't tell me that unique and, and keyword unique value proposition, then there's only two things that it can be. One is you're the lowest price, right? Uh, and that's never a good way to build a business is to be the, a building business anyway. There's other businesses obviously where that are commodity price driven, but uh, construction should not be one of them. Or uh, the other one is you're the most available. So in other words, you're the cheapest and you have no work. And so that's that's why someone should buy from you instead of the competition. And we actually want our clients to to uh, have the opposite going for them. We want we want buyers to be willing to wait uh, for them to become available and to be willing to to uh, pay a premium for that privilege. And, you know, with those things in mind, that's the way you build a viable business over time. You know, so how do you get there? Well, you have to deliver what you sell. And in order to do that, you have to define what it is you sell and make sure that that product is fitting this market niche that you're trying to, uh, you know, to fit into. I mean, whether you're going to be a green builder or a basement remodeler or a, uh, you know, a starter home builder, there's something uh, that you should be able to, to, uh, to recognize as the reason someone would purchase from you instead of the competition. New home builders, uh, you know, it might be location, right? That's a big one for, for a new home builder. You, is your land where somebody wants to live, right? That's, that's a huge advantage. And that can, you know, that can be a great one. But uh, you, there has to be something, right? So once you do that, you've sold, you know, now we go into the sales process and you've defined what it is you're going to sell. You've sold it. The next problem everybody has is getting that thing, whatever it is, actually built, right? You'd be surprised how many builders we work with. The buyer thinks they're buying X, Y, and Z, and we get all the way to the end of the job and there's options that weren't included. Uh, the wrong hardware got installed. Uh, they wanted this, they got that, et cetera, et cetera. And in order, you know, so, so that's, and that's a defect, right? I mean, that's a totally. defect along the line that we want to eliminate. So the first step is in total quality assurance is a thorough plan package review. And you, you know, everyone knows about a job start package. And, and, you know, they, they hear the term, but what is it really? The job start package should be a model, whether digital or on paper, whatever, uh, a model of what's going to be built. And we, you know, we say build it seven times in your head is kind of an offhanded way of saying, okay, 
cross all the T's before you start. So we put more in the pre-construction on the pre-construction side in order to save cycle time during construction. All right. Uh, we do, we call it an EPO review that, that, you know, that's a term for estimated purchase orders. Uh, but EPO, we sort of broadened it to mean thorough job start package review. We have a systematic way to approach this. So when we're handing the job from sales to selections and through to whoever's going to build it in the field, uh, everyone is on the same page and we can start that job cleanly, knowing that it's exactly what the customer was intending to purchase. Okay, so that's step one. Then we have a systematic way of, uh, I call it active observation. One of the tenets of lean is to try to minimize third party inspections. And otherwise, you do something wrong and then somebody comes in and tells you you did it wrong and then you got to redo it. That's a third party inspection. And lean is about building the quality into the process itself. So those defects aren't present at the end. Well, in construction, you can't totally get rid of an inspection process. Obviously, you're, there's going to always be inspections by a lot of people. But uh, we, turn the, we turn that into what we call active observation. So on a daily basis, your superintendent, your lead carpenter is looking and comparing what was sold to the work that was actually done. And if there's anything missing, you know, an outlet box that didn't get nailed in the right place or a crooked stud or whatever it happens to be, we, tr we do a transmittal on a daily basis to everybody that's on that job site, and we get those things corrected immediately. So we move through each trade as cleanly as possible, ending that trade complete and clean, zero defect, okay? And as you go through the project, if you do this relentlessly from beginning to end, when you get to the end of the project, there's not going to be a whole lot of punch lists. There's not going to be very much uh, rework involved. There may be an occasional thing, a, a last minute change that, you know, the door had to be reordered or something like that. But it's going to be very, very minimal. And the final step in this, uh, Spencer is the way the project is delivered. So now, you know, we, we went, we, uh, we formalized our product. We formalized our, uh, sales selection process. We reviewed the package. We do daily, uh, daily, uh, active observation by a trained superintendent, lead carpenter, et cetera. And now we're at the end. Uh, we have a, a comprehensive, quality control i wouldn't call it a checklist because it's the same it's the same information that was generated during the sales process except now it's even more granular so every uh piece of that puzzle uh can be checked by a superintendent lead carpenter uh is it done done correctly yes or no and at that point we call for an internal inspection and this is where Again, you know, the industry sort of falls down. Uh, we, do, we don't want the buyer to do that inspection and go on a fishing expedition looking, looking for issues. We're going to provide that in-house. So we're going to have some kind of a quality assurance team, whether it's the company owner or maybe the, a salesperson in the owner or a senior project manager, but somebody that wasn't necessarily involved day-to-day -day with the project. Uh, we give the superintendent, lead carpenter, all the information to build the project correctly. It's sort of an open book test at this point. They know exactly what the QA team is going to be looking for. So when they call call for that QA inspection, uh, it should the, the job should be as close to perfect as humanly possible. Now we come in, and as a proxy for the customer, we internally inspect that job and give it the final walk through and blessing you know some builders might call it a white glove walk uh you know a total quality walk whatever but at that point we know because we've been more thorough than the customer is going to be all the way through the process we know that what was sold actually got produced and produced correctly 
and now we have a zero defect job, okay? So what do we do next? Well, next, we orient the buyer. So instead of bringing somebody in for a blue tape session or a punch list, you know, the expectation is it's gonna be a new vehicle delivery. And just like a car dealer is gonna demonstrate those features to the new car buyer, we're going to demonstrate the, the project uh, to the homeowner. And, and uh, you know, we call that a hoot homeowner orientation tour. And that's not a, that's not a term we, we fabricated. I mean, it's been out there. I think Carol Smith, who's the absolute maven of, of, uh, you know, total quality and, and uh, customer relations and so forth. I think Carol coined that term, but the bottom line is, you know, this is a celebration at this point. Uh, and literally it should be a red carpet tour. I mean, some builders actually roll out a red carpet to introduce their buyer to this to their new home or to, to their new project and even if even if the people have been around the, the the site every day you know we 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 have to still go through this ceremonial process of delivery and uh the homeowner orientation tour uh at that point now we can certify and we have the buyer certify that everything is done correctly and they're signing off at this point. Again, the expectation is that the project is as perfect as humanly possible at this point, but now we're signing off that there's no damage, right? There's no damage to flooring, there's no damage to counters, there's no scratches on the wall. Everything is ready for them to take possession and we document it photographically uh, in writing and so forth. That way we don't get into the endless warranty, you know, and, and you know, I talk about the two red lines in the sand, right? The first red line is getting the job start package put together correctly and putting the job into motion correctly. In other words, you spend more time in pre-construction to spend less time during the construction phase. That's the first red line. This one is the second red line. You're ending the construction process uh, with, a, with a hard red line in the sand and moving into warranty, okay? So there's no question. Uh, you, you're not gonna have somebody uh, generating punch list after punch list after punch list, and every time somebody's back in the project, they do damage to something else, and so now we've got something else we've gotta fix. Uh, no, we're delivering uh, a job that's complete, clean, exactly what the buyer purchased, at the quality level they purchased, and now we can smoothly go into warranty and warranty service. And by the way, if you've done all that, warranty issues uh, become very minor. You know, warranty should be, you know, really isolated to uh, a manufactured product that, that breaks for some reason, the dishwasher stops working, or maybe a fitting works loose after, you know, a thousand hot cold cycles and there's a drip that needs to be tightened up, something like that very minor things that somebody should be able to uh, take care of with a, uh, you know, very quickly, you know, and, and a 30 day checkup or, you know, 60 day, whatever, whatever the, the company decides to do. Totally. But that's, you know, that's the second red line in the sand and going into warranty. I mean, you know, the way, the way we do that is, 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 uh, is pretty backwards in this industry as well. I mean, think about this. You've got uh, subcontractors. Let's take drywallers and roofers. They're, they're the most fun to pick on because they're typically the least housebroken of your subs. They don't typically work in new, inside of new finished homes, et cetera. So what do we typically do? Well, we've got some drywall nail pops that need to be taken care of. And maybe there's some problems with flashing or something, and the roofers have to come back and do something. So we drag these guys back. Uh, they're not trained in customer service. Uh, the company's going to send their greenhorns out probably to do this, just to say they did it. And so what, this is why you get, uh, you know, people washing out their mud pans in the in the front bushes and tracking tar on the, you know. Uh, through the new carpet and hardwood floors and stuff 
and this is what builders are doing, you know, and considering it to be good customer service and, and warranty follow up. And we, we have a completely different approach to that too. Yeah, so. it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. And I'm glad you kind of walked us through, you know, the zero punch list and the two bright lines. Cause I feel like a lot of this is really just about putting a little extra work up front and kind of as you go along and then suddenly you've eliminated all these problems and kind of coming back and the rework and that stuff gets so expensive and from a scheduling and time perspective it's just it can become a real nightmare and so um yeah I feel it's like, ridiculous i mean yeah. you're talking about waste reduction this is 100 percent waste okay any kind of rework is 100 percent waste and so you know this is this is what you want to avoid like the plague and uh you know, the, the, to, to do that, well, so, so we recommend a different approach to warranty. And that is we want people, if you're going to, you know, when you have warranty issues, we want them addressed by trained customer service oriented people, uniformed, company truck, clean, yes or no ma'am uh, people uh, that know the product and uh, can either fix the issue themselves on the spot or uh, if it's something more major which you know if if all the steps have been followed that'll be a rarity but if they do need to get a subcontractor back in uh, they become the manager for that so we recommend the builder actually or, or the remodeler actually establish what we would call a pro handyman service right and this becomes a little separate profit center uh, as your homes go out of warranty, people still need to have things fixed. And I mean, you can you can get stuff built anywhere in the U.S. You can get stuff remodeled, uh, but try to go to you know one of the growing areas, say you know uh, in Texas or anywhere south of the Mason Dixon or anywhere where you've got an influx of people. Try to get something serviced. It's almost impossible uh, unless you happen to know a guy. Uh, and you know, guy down the street or, or whatever, it's very difficult to get anything repaired. And the same is true for new home buyers that have been in a home uh, that's just you know just out of warranty. You know, they've been in a home two, three, four years. Who do they call to get a faucet replaced? Who do they call to get a a, a light fixture tightened up or a railing put on or a, you know another small deck built? I mean, it's almost impossible to find these services in some parts of the country. So the builder themselves can can establish this as a profit center, and so they have their own pro handyman service. And this is a whole, you know, this is this is a whole program, you know, pro handyman. There's there's franchises out there you can buy into. Case Handyman is one. There's and there's others, uh, or we can help you get started with it. But the idea being that you're going to use someone that's trained in these areas to handle your own warranty work as a builder. So instead of having to spend half a percent of revenue to cover your warranty, you've got something that's actually, uh, you know, putting a little bit back to the bottom line and actually eliminating that warranty liability altogether. Yeah. Uh, or at least the awesome. expense side of it. Yeah. 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 And it makes great. good sense. And, and, and now you've established, You've got a brand amb ambassador out there in the community. You can monitor how the products and services are holding up the durability over time, right? Uh, every This is something builders, they lose track of. Are, are those faucets that we spec two years ago, are they holding up? Are they going to last for the, the life of the mortgage? Are they going to fail in two years because of something? This is the way you can find out. You can have somebody back in the home uh, with an eye on this stuff. And you've also got a built-in referral pipeline uh, that flies completely under the radar of your competition. You know, so now you, you can use your own pro handyman service to, to, to take care of your warranty issues, but also to continually mine for referral business. And remember way back at the beginning of this conversation, I said that marketing was one of those two areas that you want to fully fund. Well, this is one way to do it, you know, and you're not spending the money on advertising. You're spending it a little bit of it on, uh, you know, better follow up from your own from your own warranty department. Totally. 
Yeah, and and Joe, this has been awesome. I mean, I can. Uh, it's fun to just hear your passion about this topic and kind of you know the opportunity really that's out there for a lot of these uh, these builders and remodeling companies. And I got one more question to kind of wrap us up, but I guess before I get to that last question, you know, if people want to learn more about you or kind of what you're up to or connect with you online, what's the what's the best way to do that? Okay, great. Well, there, of course, they could go to our website and you know Mountain Consulting dot com is out there and also smaconsulting.net uh, a firm I do a lot of work with but we have we actually have a conference coming up it's uh, best practices in home building conference we do it every May in Orlando uh, and it's you know it's it's a, one of the off it's at one of the off-site Disney hotels but oh, nice. we we get together we get together with uh, a couple hundred of our best clients and uh, you know, our, you know, our top uh, experts in each of these areas, for instance, I mentioned Carol Smith, she'll be there speaking, Scott Sedam, he's a lean guy, he'll be there, Bob Whitten, uh, the general manager at SMA, uh, you know, and, and a full bevy, uh, Bob Schultz, who's the, the home builder sales guy, uh, they actually partner with us uh, to produce the conference, so they do the sales and marketing side. But it's become a, just a great, great networking event. And, it, you know, we teach these things kind of soup to nuts at the conference. And any, any of your listeners, uh, they can meet some of our better clients and talk to them about how some of these things are working for them and what they're doing. Just a great time to, to uh, get involved in this, you know, if you're looking at lean and total quality and, and uh, best practices. Uh, it's a place, good place to get started. Cool. Yeah, that's that's excellent. We'll make sure we link to the conference uh, in the the show notes so people can learn more about that. And um, I guess just to wrap us up here today, Joe, if you could leave our listeners with just one piece of advice in thinking about kind of this topic, you know, what would you leave them with as kind of a, a takeaway? Start right to end right. <laughs> you know, nip it. Uh, Find the issues early, correct them quickly, nip it in the bud. You know, head it off at the pass, whatever, uh, whatever euphemism you want to use. The, the key is uh, not, letting, not letting things pile up. Start cleanly, uh, work efficiently, and, and draw those red lines in the sand between construction, uh, between sales selections and construction, and then between construction and warranty. And you'll, you know, you'll, you'll work a lot smarter uh, and have a much easier, a much easier life if you do those things. That's awesome. Yeah, that's great advice. And Joe, thanks for spending some time with me today. This was awesome. There's a lot of good, good information in here, a lot of takeaways for people that they can get out there and start improving their businesses. So thanks for joining me. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, we'll talk to you soon. Thanks again, Joe. Okay. Take care.